Narayanam Naskritam Naram Cheva Narottamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Dhiraya Nesta Preshu Bhadresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shoki Bhakti Bhavati Naistiki Nigama Kapurur Garitam Param Shukamakana Vita Dravi Samitam Ibata Bhagavatam Rasharam Mahora Hora Sikubhuga Bhakti Hem Krishna Swadam Bhagate Dhamakini Hesaha Karona Stadri Samisha Paranako Juno Dita Ham Tama Pia Dabashuta Vishutam Vibhu Samapia Vinam Vinutaram Pratyahi the Homo Hara Dadmanam Sanklesh and Nirvana Musanti Nanyataham Anarta Vashamam Shakshad Bhakti Yoga Mahakshara Loka Sajjadatam Chakra Satpada Samitam Admaramasta Mune and the Granti Gatwick Korvanti Haitikim Vidyamita Bhutta Ganahari Om Aganati Maranda Sangarangara Saratya Chaksurin Minitam Yanatash Mahi Sri Gadavirma Sri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Stapitam Yanabhutare Sayam Rupa Karamayam Darati Svaparantikam Vanneham Sri Guru Siyata Parakamanam Sri Gunan Vaishnavam Sya Sri Rupam Sagaritam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Stam Sadevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sayatam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Paran Sahagana Larita Sri Vishakan Vitam Stam Namam Vishnu Paraya Krishna Pasaya Bhutare Sri Madhi Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamani Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pacharini Nirvishesa Sonivari Praskita Desadhani Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Giradhar Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vinna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Good morning Govinda Dev as well as Jean Brent Rakesh Raghava Govinda Raj Good morning to all of you and welcome to Motivational Monday. I know that. And good morning, Rob. Rob, tell me your impressions about last night at the temple for Balaram Purnima. Uh, there was an excellent energy, Prabhuji. Um, I really enjoyed seeing everyone uh, dancing and hearing everyone singing and chanting. Um, there was a really good vibe there uh, last night. It was a really good turnout as well. Yeah, it was about 100 people, which is quite good for <clears throat> um, Salt Lake City. We had Radhika Ravan from all the way from Logan to give the main talk. I remember at one point I was doing the RT. This was after the Abhishekam, after the talk, um, just before we go in for the Prashadam. And I turned around with the flame to offer it to the audience, and everybody was in motion. It was huge circles and swinging, and it was just ecstatic you know Ishan was leading the RT um, so it seems like everybody had a good time I was so uh, moved by Radhika Raman's uh, presentation on Balaram that I wanted to try and <clears throat> review some of that this morning I know Rakesh was there and I know Brett was there and I know Rob was there um, and and you and and so this would be a repetition of what you heard at least in my own um, limited way, but I want to I want to realize those truths that Radha Karman laid out for us last night. And the best way to realize something is to repeat it. That's our whole process: Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam. So let's just go back over some of the nectarine highlights of Radha Karman's class. First, he started off by talking about Vrindavan as a physical place, which you can reach. It's 90 kilometers south of Delhi. It takes about three hours by car or by taxi. Uh, it's crowded. There's monkeys there. There's peacocks there. There's pigs there. Um, that's the Vrindavan that you can see. But there's another Vrindavan, which is a special place. It is an extension of Krishna's own home. Krishna's own plan is called Goloka Vrindavan, and Vrindavan is called Gokula. So it's Krishna's home away from home. Radhika Raman said that if there were a job description of God, it would be the one who creates millions and millions of universes, the one who uh, computes all of one's good and bad karmic actions and gives the various results for them, the one who causes the flowers to bloom in the spring, the one who makes the snow fall in the winter. There are a number of verses that come to mind. Madhvayat bhatya bhatyam suri stapati varsatindyam mritus charati madhvayat. 
The tides flow according to the orders of the Lord. The sun rises and sets according to the orders of the Lord. The seasons change according to the orders of the Lord. The wind blows according to the orders of the Lord. And death goes about chasing everyone according to the orders of the Lord. So if there's one word, vernacular word, that could sum up the role of Krishna in terms of universal affairs is that he's the boss. Ishwara Parama Krishna. He's the boss of all bosses. Most bosses have a boss above them, and that boss has above them, and that boss has above them. And you go ultimately to the heads of the planets, the Lokapals, the presiding deities of the various planets. And yet they also, Aham Adirhi Devanam Marishanam Chasarvashaham, the creator of the demigods, the creators of the planetary uh, sovereigns, that is Krishna. He is the one to whom everyone answers. And everybody moves according to his directions. There's another verse which is spoken by Vritrasura. Yadbhaji tantam guna kama bihi sadhishtira vatsavyam sarva bahema balamishura protana shuvaji padeshpade. The planets all orbit according to the predetermined uh, directions of the Lord. Just like bulls, strong, powerful bulls have a ring in their noses, and that ring controls them. They don't have any independent movement. As potentially powerful as they are, their every action, their every twitch is governed by that ring in their nose. You see in India, the bulls, cows go round and around and around, and they're um, grinding the grains into flour. They just go around. They would like to go off here and they would like to go off there, but they don't. They just go around. So similarly, millions of planets are all orbiting at uh, thousands of miles an hour. Big, huge masses. If they were to collide it into each other, it would be unthinkable. And yet they all orbit at thousands of miles an hour without crashing into each other. That's all according to the control, the arrangement of Krishna. Rajasura goes on to say, Loka Sapali Yashame Shashanti Bhipsha, Dwija Ibasi Chibada Sakali, and we're all like birds caught in a net. We act according to the dictation of the Lord. Someone says, Well, how about people that don't believe in God? How about people that don't recognize the control of the laws of God? Well, they're nevertheless under the control of God, just like prisoners are also, even though they think of themselves as exempt from following the laws, they get hit over the head by the policemen, they get dragged away, and their freedom is severely limited because of trying to be independent from the government. Those who don't care for the laws of God, they don't achieve happiness, they don't achieve perfection, nor do they achieve the ultimate desired destination. One way or another, Krishna or God is the boss. He's the boss of the bosses of the bosses of the bosses. <laughs> he is that boss than whom no other boss can be greater or equal. He's the boss of all bosses. And yet, in Vrindavan, Krishna is not the boss of anything. Vrindavan is Krishna's home. Vrindavan is a place where Krishna doesn't want to be in charge. In the Chaitanya Charmini, there's a verse which is quoted. It says, Krishna gets tired <clears throat> of being bowed down to. He gets tired of the Hari Bowls, the Hosannas, and the Hallelujahs, and the, the fawning. He gets tired of wielding the scepter of power, and causing everything to move with intricate precision by his influence. He gets tired of ruling governing over millions and millions of demigods and planets, and he wants to hear the chastising words of Srimati Radharani. He he'd rather be chastised, governed himself by his devotees, than he would govern millions and millions and millions of universes. So as, whereas God is normally in charge of everything outside of Vrindavan, inside of Vrindavan, he's not in charge of anything. He's not in charge of it. And whereas God is the main principle behind order and precision and harmony in the universe, it is the will of God that causes everything to go so nicely. Krishna is the 
Krishna says, if I did not act, if I did not pay attention, if I was not expanded in each and every atom in the hearts of living beings, it would result in chaos. If I kicked back and sat in my lazy boy with my big gup and did nothing for even a few moments, the whole world would be put to ruination. And so Krishna exerts his unlimited influence so that we can depend upon the sun rising, the seasons changing, rain coming, and uh, live a happy life and execute our Krishna consciousness. However, in Vrindavan, not only does Krishna not take the responsibility or not have the responsibility for precision, for harmony, for everything going well, but he's the number one, and I don't think Radhika Ramon touched on this point, it's just something I thought I'd throw in there. Krishna in Vrindavan, whereas outside of Vrindavan, he, 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 he is order personified. He is organization personified. Inside Vrindavan, he's the number one disruptive entity. No one is more disruptive in Vrindavan than Krishna. If there's a ruckus, if there's a if there's a bruhaha, you can bet that Krishna's behind it, either directly or indirectly. <laughs> either he's uh, feeding hard-earned butter and yogurt and cheese to the monkeys, or he's stealing the clothes of the gopis, or he's cutting up some joke, or he's hiding, or he's sneaking around at midnight. Um, he and his friends are always up to mischief. Nothing particularly constructive that Krishna engages in in Vrindavan. His job is to make everyone running after him, thinking about him, concerned about him, uh, apprehensive perhaps even about what he's going to do next. Krishna has total freedom to harass his devotees. Think about it. You have one or two good friends in your life. You have one or two people now or in the past with whom you are inseparable. Uh, they almost read your mind, two or almost one. How do you, what is the highest form of relish <clears throat> between really, really good friends? I had a good friend, Batsal. I knew him in uh, Berkeley, California. He was there when I was temple president the whole time. And we were together in Los Angeles temple. And then he moved to Spanish Fork and opened a restaurant in Provo for a number of years before finally moved out of state. And we've kind of lost touch a little bit in the last few years. But we were very, very good friends. What we did, we would insult each other. We would give little digs at each other. We knew each other so well. We knew how to push each other's buttons. We knew each other's weak points and all. And we would make fun of them, but not in a challenging, competitive, envious way, just in a friendly, friendly way. It's a high level, perhaps the highest level of intimacy and relish. So Krishna is always harassing his devotees He's always demanding their attention to the point that in order to get her household duties done, one time Mother Yashoda bound up Krishna to a big mortar, big heavy mortar with ropes, just so that she could get Krishna off her back and just do a little bit of household cleaning and cooking. But Krishna doesn't allow peace, predictability in Vrindavan, even for a moment. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hari, Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari, Hari. He's the subordinate of his foster mother and father, Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda Mai. He sees the elderly gopis, gopas as his aunts and uncles, and he offers respect uh, to them. Um, he doesn't even take the role of the elder brother Balaram, but rather Balaram is the elder brother because the elder brother has more influence. The elder brother basically tells the younger brother what to do. And Krishna is not in charge of anything. He's not over anything. He doesn't have any particular influence based on his age or his gender or his position in the society. Um, but if there is one person who stands out as taking the burden off of Krishna, leaving Krishna free to do his mischief and to relish reciprocal relationships with his devotees. If there's one person 
who assumes that responsibility and stands between Krishna and those who would disturb uh, or violate Krishna's intimate back and forth with his devotees, it is Balaram. And Balaram controls Vrindavan, the home of Krishna, in two important ways. One is that he's extremely merciful. He's always willing if someone's willing to work with Balaram, Balaram's willing to work with them, to equip them, to prepare them, to elevate them, to make and mold them in such a way that they can join the intimate pastimes of Krishna. Nikunjayono Ratikeri Siddhi Yayala Bijuti Rapekshaniya. If you approach Lord Balaram, who is in fact the representative of the spiritual master, Brahmanda Brahmite Kono Bhagavana Jiva, Guru Krishna Prashade Pai Bhakti Lotam Bhiv. When one becomes serious about getting out from underneath the foot of illusion, Maya, and seriously inquires about the meaning of life, the purpose for which we're here, it is said at that point, as a result of your serious, inquisitive attitude, Krishna intimates that, just like you can tell the type of a flower by its fragrance. So Krishna intimates your sincerity, your hankering to resolve the problems of birth, death, disease, and old age in this material world. And he, he appears before you as Balaram or Nityananda, the guru. And the guru will work with you. If you're willing to um, take the lessons, take the instruction from the guru, the guru will take you under their arm take you under their protection, and they will educate you, they will refine you and cultivate you to the point where you can become dasana, 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 a servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of oh, glory Krishna. Radha Kurman gave the best possible example of this phenomenon. In the Mahabharata, even Krishna, what to speak of Arjuna, Yudhisthira, they didn't want to have anything to do with Duryodhana. Duryodhan was such a insulting, scathing, abrasive, envious, conspiratorial, jealous personality that even Krishna himself uh, kept his distance. Ar Arjuna, Yudhisthira, they were polite, they were respectful, they observed all the social niceties, but they never warmed up to Duryodhan. Better to keep your enemies at a distance. But Balaram, some or other, he felt that there was redeeming qualities within Duryodhana. And indeed, Duryodhana loved Balaram. Duryodhana would do whatever Balaram asked him to do. It was Balaram who trained Duryodhana up in the art of the gutta, the art of warfare with the club. There was a very intimate relationship between Duryodhana and Balaram. And indeed, we can well imagine that under the training or during the time that Duryodhan was with Balaram, whatever good qualities Duryodhan had would have been evoked. But even the association of Balaram could not reform Duryodhan from his unrelenting envy of the Pandavas and indeed by extension Lord Krishna. So there was one instant where I think it was Aniruddha and uh, Duryodhana's daughter had fallen in love with each other, and they eloped. Duryodhana's daughter left the palace of Duryodhana in Hastinapur and went to live with the Yadavas. And the Kauravas were angry, they were enraged, they were upset, they had had other plans, Duryodhana had other plans for his daughter, and all of a sudden, where is she? She's gone. Where had, Who is she gone? She's gone to live with Krishna, and, and the, who's the friend of the Pandavas. And uh, they were up in arms. They were going to send an army to the Yadava city to attack them in retaliation. And uh, Krishna and Arjuna and all were preparing to defend themselves. But Balaram, having a soft spot for Duryodhana, he said, let me go. Let's just calm down. Let's just chill here. I'm sure we can come to some understanding. And Balaram went in a very mild, 
very gentle, very conciliatory mood to Hasanapur. He laid it all out. Um, you know, who could marry better? Who could marry higher than marrying a son of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead? He's the Lord of all living beings. Um, he can offer protection to those who are surrendered unto him. Uh, the girl and the boy love each other. She doesn't want to get married. She doesn't want to be part of an arranged marriage, a political expedient marriage that Jerry had done as arranged. So let's just take this as a, a good outcome. You know, it's all based on attitude. And so there are a lot worse things that could have happened to Jerry Dunn's daughter. And in fact, I can't think of any better one. So he made this very conciliatory, reasonable, mild, generous, merciful proposal to the Kauravas that instead of mustering up an army and going to fight, let's go with offerings, with uh, gifts, Let's go and celebrate. Let's all come together. There's nothing more exciting. There's nothing that brings people together more than a wedding. It's the most delightful happenstance. So instead of enmity, let's try amity. Let's go and all celebrate, bury the hatchet, and uh, wish this young couple well. What he got for his proposal was abuse. Um, insults. The Karavas headed by Duryodhana said that the, Yad the Yadavas are like dogs at our door. They're not worthy to receive worship by the Chamara whisks or to wear crowns. Uh, they're like the shoes on our feet. <clears throat> so we'd seen the spiritual master side, the teacher side of Balaram, which is the, the, the side which is mild and generous and forgiving. Uh, gives the benefit of the doubt. But when the Kaurava started to insult Krishna and his devotees, a great anger, a world-destroying anger came out of Sri Balaram. And he's known as the carrier of the plow, Halayuda. He uses a plow and he needs it as a weapon. So what he did was he sunk his plow into the ground in Hastinapur. And with his unlimited supreme power, he, he, he sunk the plow in the soil of Hastinapur. And then somewhere other by his mystic power, he was pulling the entire city. Now Hastinapur, Hasti means elephant, and Pur means place. The ancient title of the city, which was somewhere in the vicinity of present-day Delhi, was a place of elephants. Can imagine the wealth, the opulence. How much does it take to maintain even one elephant? They eat 500 kgs of food every day. So there are thousands and thousands of elephants in the city of elephants. You can just imagine the opulence. The population was in the millions with roads and parks and palaces, and governmental buildings, and marketplaces, and bazaars, place where craftsmen live. All that with his plow, with the tip of his plow, Balaram started dragging a whole city to dump it into the Amuna River. All the Karavas came to their senses. Whoa, we forgot who we're dealing with here. One point that Radhika Raman made during his talk is the only difference in Krishna, the supreme personality of God had been whom no one can be equal to, and his brother Balaram. The only difference between them is their complexion. Krishna's blackish and Balaram's white. That's the only difference. Otherwise, there's no difference between the power of Balaram and the power of Krishna. They're both unlimitedly powerful. Here is Balaram dragging the whole city of Hastinapur to dump it in the Yamuna River. And at that point, Duryodhana, all of Sukuni, Karna, everybody came to their senses and they began to offer prayers to Balaram and they saw the error of their ways, decided it would be in their best interest to do what Balaram had said. And so they went and celebrated the marriage of uh, Aniruddha and Duryodhana's daughter. But this story, which was so expertly told by Radhikama, shows the two sides of Balaram. One is that he wants everyone to be engaged in the service of the Lord. That no matter how bad you are, Balaram, the 
spiritual master will work with you. He'll, he'll find a redeeming quality. He'll find an anointing. He'll find some quality, some talent, some ability with which God has uh, anointed you, and he will link you up. He'll dovetail your propensities in the service of the Lord. He'll work with you. At the same time, Radhika Raman said there are two qualities of a good teacher. One is that a good teacher is um, very merciful, very willing to give of him or herself almost unlimitedly if the student is willing to be made and molded. However, if the student shows any sort of whimsy or capriciousness or rebellion or disobedience, at that time, this teacher knows also how to be very, very strict. Those are the two sides of Balaram. He invites anybody to come to Krishna, provided they will undergo the training. Nobody can come to Krishna other than on the recommendation of a bona fide spiritual master. Do not be any in any illusion about this. Every day we talk and we come to the same conclusion. It is only Yasha Prashada, Bhagavad Prashada, Yasha Prashada Nati, Gayam Stuvam Stashad. Vande Gorosi Charanada Binda. Every Hare Krishna devote uh, throughout the world starts their day by offering their respectful obeisances eight times and in eight different ways to the lotus feet of the spiritual master. It is only by the mercy of the spiritual master that one can get the mercy of Krishna. And the original spiritual master is Balaram. He's very kind. He makes all the arrangements for Krishna's pastimes. He decides, you do this, you make the flower gods. You play the veena, you dance, you you make the breeze go. He he makes all the arrangements for the optimal enjoyment between Krishna and his devotees, and he has a place in mind for each and every one of us. That's the mercy of Balaram. No one is left out. No one is excluded. Everybody uh, can rise to the highest level of being a servant of a servant of a servant of a servant of a servant of, a servant of Krishna. And Radhika Raman explained that the significance of the, the plow is not primarily as a weapon, but Balaram will take his plow and he'll get the roots out of your soil. The, the envy, the competitiveness, the jealousy, the lust, the anger, the greed. Balaram will take his plow and he will work with your soil in such a way that all those things which are contrary to devotional service are removed. We presently have gardens that are may amazing. We have super s plants that I can only describe as super plants here in Spanish Fork. The corn is like 13 feet tall. The zucchini plants come up to your, come up to your uh, neck. And that's all because of what we've done with the soil. You know, the soil is a critical factor. You can have a great seed, you can have great rainfall, you can have good sunshine, you can have all the conditions for growth. But if the soil is rocky or if the soil is full of clay, you're not going to get optimal growth. You're going to get stunted, dwarfed plants and vegetables and fruits. So the soil has to be first class and full of nutrition. What we did uh, this year is we, um, we have fish in our lake, and our lake is the highest point on the property. So we use the lake water to water our two gardens, which are lower than the garden. We don't have to pump the water down to the gardens. In the spring, we just lay out the lines, we blow the lines with some water, I mean some air, pressurized air, to make sure they're clear of sediment. And then we, we um, siphon, we, we suck the water. It start the water running, and then the water is basically always coming downhill by the force of gravity. And then you just turn the lines on and off. So what we did this year, the the fish in the lake, of course, they defecate, and that makes a sediment on the bottom of the lake, which is extremely rich in nutrients. And we hadn't pumped out that sediment for many years, and so we got a pump and we got a, a line, and we fed that <clears throat> that hose into the bottom of the lake where there was about three or four feet really of muck. And we pumped that out, but we didn't just pump it out anywhere. We, we made furrows, irrigation ditches in both the gardens, 
and in the early spring we pumped all that out and just filled the gardens with gallons and gallons and gallons of this incredibly rich nutritious uh, fertilizer so that soil is uh, uh, unbelievable soil and now here it is almost September we're getting uh, more zucchini more green peppers more tomatoes more corn more melons than we could have ever thought possible people drive by and they say what in the world did you do to supercharge your gardens and it was all because of the soil so the Lord Balaram is called Haliuda, the wielder of the club mm. He will work with our soil. He will cultivate it. He will put in nutrients. He will enrich it. He will help us keep uh, uh, squash bugs and uh, <laughs> destructive elements out. And in this way, Lord Balaram, as the original spiritual master, can take us to the lotus feet of the lotus feet of the lotus feet of the lotus feet of those who are engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord. Therefore, he said, we should all pray to Lord Balaram for shelter, for direction, and we should all be willing to be made in mold after the instructions of Krishna's elder brother, Sriman Balaram Prabhu. If uh, Brent or Rakesh or Rob, Rob, was that pretty much it? Do you remember anything additionally that I left out? I, uh, I do not recall. Um, I actually, unfortunately, missed the speaker, um, but I'm planning on watching it after, uh, after we get off this call. I'm going to watch the post that was made about it. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to download that and put it on our YouTube channel, too. It's an MP4. It was so, so wonderful, so relishable. You know, Radhi Karman is the most Krishna conscious person I know. There isn't a time in his life uh, even when he was being educated, he was being homeschooled by his totally Krishna conscious mother. And, so, and like many Indians, he has a PhD. Indian people generally like to go to the highest level of education that they can. So uh, they're always, even if they have a, a BA, they're always working on their MA or their MBA. And once they get their MA or the MBA, they'll work on their PhD. Um, in, Indian people are the people who are most after education, as far as I can tell. They're always educating themselves, they're always sharpening themselves, they're always improving themselves. So many Indians have a PhD, and Radhi Kamamana has a PhD as well. So, of course, he's not Indian, he's born in America, but you know what I'm talking about. But but the difference, how Radhi Kamamana is different from most other people of Indian ancestry, is that his PhD is in theology. <laughs> And, and what does India have to give to the world? I mean, what is India known for? It's known for God consciousness. India is the seat, the recognized seat of yoga, spirituality, asceticism. And yet out of all the Indians who have PhDs and MAs, I only know of one that opted to sharpen his God-given birthright as a God-conscious person at Cambridge University and then take up the position of teaching. Reminds me of what Prabhupada said. He said Indians are not known for technology. America is known for technology. And he said the Indians, this was in the 70s and 80s, he mentioned that the Indians are all the brain drain. They're all coming to America to imitate the Americans by getting technology to come begging for technological uh, training and degrees from America. None of them are taking up the mission of Lord Chaitanya, Bharata Bhumi Jehadam If you've taken birth in Bharat Barsha, then you're automatically, by Krishna conscious, more or less, and your duty is to spread that to people all over the world. So Prabhupada said, he said, well, none, none of them are coming to America to spread God consciousness. They're all coming to take, to beg technology from the Americans. But he said, never mind, at least one Indian it's following the teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, I mean, honestly, how have thousands of Indians taking up technology made a big difference in the world? And yet, one Indian like Radhika Raman, one Indian like Prabhupada, who have stepped up to the great, wonderful, antique heritage of India as a God-conscious place, have infected the whole world. Of course, I'm not meaning to criticize people who are 
uh, MBAs and PhDs. They're very honest, upright citizens. They're essential for the well-being uh, and smooth-running economy of the countries in which they live in their own diaspora. And of course, they're wonderfully generous. They're our best friends all over the world. We just had um, yesterday a wonderful uh, friend of ours. He divides his time between New York and Utah. And I guess he's been tied up in New York for most of COVID because of travel restrictions and all. But he had loaned us $20,000, an interest-free personal loan to help us finish the construction of the temple. The temple in Salt Lake City ended up costing twice what it was originally estimated to cost. And we ran out of money two-thirds of the way through. And so it was all Indian people, mostly, except Govinda Dave is a notable exception, who stepped forward and gave personal loans in order that we complete the construction of the temple. Um, we finished it exactly two years ago. Yesterday, Brahma, uh, Balaram Pornam was coincidentally the Brahmotsava, the two-year anniversary of the time that we were able to open the temple. And at the time we opened the temple, we had $350,000 worth of debt to individuals that had given us interest-free loans. And one by one, most of those, including our Western friend Govinda Dave, forgave the majority of those loans. We were able to pay some of them back and others forgave those loans. And the most recent loan forgiveness came just Saturday night, the day before Balaram Purnima from Ashish Gupta, who I said, Ashish, I haven't seen you for, I've been thinking about you. We owe you some money. And he just gave me this blank look. Like this man is so pure. It's just, he's just, he's just so pure and so fresh. He look he looks at me and he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. I said, Ashish, you loaned he said, What what money? I said, two years ago you loaned us. He gave twenty two thousand, two thousand was an outright donation, and twenty thousand was an interest free loan to be paid back between one or two years. And so I said, The edge of the envelope was here. It's almost two years since we took out that loan, and I've been thinking about how I need to pay you back. And he looks at me and says, What money? And I'm like Oh my gosh, is this guy pure or what? You know, he hadn't even remembered his twenty thousand. I'm sure he's not that rich. He's just a young man starting out in the business. And he said, "Oh, forget it." I mean, just like that. I, I, he just said, "Oh, forget it." You know, I'm like, all right, how do you know? You know, and he's, just, "Oh, forget it." You know, I don't even hardly remember it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, on the one side, you know. Every person of Indian descent has this legacy to pass on to the world. Um, but if you're trained in technology or enterprise or in uh, business business administration, then that's okay too. Then just use your expertise to make money and support Krishna consciousness. And do not neglect that your children get trained up in the science of God consciousness. I remember seeing one video of Prabhupada I think he was making a recording. He was in the studio laying down tracks to a record album called Transcendental Meditations. And I remember when I first came to the temple in Australia, uh, Upendra, there were turntables in those days, and Upendra had one copy of that record, Transcendental Meditations. And it would it was a soundtrack for our lives, the first few months of Krishna. It would play it over and over and over and over again. And it had been played so much, there were a lot of pops and a Nick's in it. No, no. I can remember that my uh, introductory months in Krishna consciousness are almost uh, simultaneous with the soundtrack that transcendent one. So Prabhupada, you know, he'd make a harmonium track, he'd make a voice track. So he was making the Madanga track for that thing. And, and there was a pause in the recording. Some of his disciples were around. And Prabhupada was talking about himself as a child, his father and his mother. And he said, he said, uh, my mother wanted me to become a big lawyer. He went to Scottish Church College. Uh, my mother wanted me to become a big lawyer, a very affluent, worldly man. But my father, he wanted this. And he pointed to the Midanga. And the inference was he wanted me to be a devotee. He didn't want me to follow in the path of economic development. He wanted me be a devotee. So 
and those of you who have jobs and are earners and fathers and children, more power to you. We're so appreciative. Uh, we're so grateful for you having provided the donations by which we can have beautiful temples in Salt Lake City and Spanish for. But uh, we do urge you, make sure that like Prabhupada's father, your children are privy, that your children are informed and aware and trained up in the culture which defines them, in the culture which really is the only culture which can make a significant difference in the world today and bring about that peace uh, and tranquility and harmony after which we all hanker. And uh, I have to say, people like Rakesh, like Kapil, like Ras Vilas, like Ajay, they're doing a great job. Radhika Raman, we were talking last night out on the grass, having a beautiful feast cooked by Ras Vilas. His son, Krishna, had led one of the early kirtans. His wife, uh, uh, Amrita Sundari, performed RT, and they both organized the Abhishekam. Um, Radhika Ramadan noted, he said, what I really like about this temple is the youth. The youth are really stepping up. You know? The youth are really stepping up. And they're getting all the education, they're getting all the mundane education, but they're also getting Krishna conscious. And that's how it should be. Two tracks, not just one track, but a balance in one's life between the material and the spiritual. We all need skills to put a roof over our head and raise a family, but none of that makes any sense. None of that has any value unless you have the other track running of Krishna consciousness. And Radhika Karman commented on how successful the Salt Lake City Temple seems to be in engaging the youth. And in fact, while we were there, Ishan, who, who is a, he goes to national debates with his school debate team, and he gives great, great classes at the temples whenever he's assigned to do it on Saturday nights. He asked Radhika Raman, what is your preparation? What is your talk, sermon, Prabhupada preparation look like? He asked Radhika Raman to break it down. Because here is a young person who hungers after being able to assimilate and communicate the science of Krishna consciousness to everyone that he meets. So I'll just end. You can see the smile that that puts on my face at the thought of young people taking up the baton, spreading and continuing to spread Krishna consciousness after we disappear over the western horizon tomorrow or the day after. Well, thanks very much, all of you, for putting up with my ramblings. I really wanted to commit that lesson of Radha Karman's I wanted it to embed, I wanted to tattoo it in my spirit. And so I thought I'll repeat it as best I can. I'll recollect those wonderful nectarine words and I will I will repeat them. I will pass them on. We we'll all chew them. We'll all chew them a second time. And unlike material topics, the more you rehearse them, the more you go over them, the more you review them, the more stale they get. But spiritual topics are just the opposite. The more you pass them on, the more you chew them, the more you relish them, the more juicy they get. Sukadeva was spoken to by Vyasadeva. And when Sukadeva spoke to Pariksit, the Bhagavatam was even more relishable. It was even more tasty. And when Sutta Goswami spoke to the sages of Nemesharanya, it was even more relishable. Prabhupada told all of his disciples, you also, your life is a commentary. Follow 90% of the previous acharyas. But also, you live the Bhagavatam. You add your own stories, your own narrations to the bulk, to the opus of the Bhagavatam and pass it down to future generations. So that's what we're all trying to do in our own humble way. So you guys also, you know, you pass it on. You don't, you don't worry about repeating or plagiarizing. That's not a part of our culture. We want to repeat. We want to steal as much as we can from those who are further along in the path in the hopes that we will get some particles of dust of realization and devotion from their lotus feet. Thanks very much for all of you, for your kindness, for your patience. William, ramble on. Just ramble on. 
There is a brouhaha in Vrindavan and Krishna's behind it. Thank you, Chapter Shekhar. You guys are hilarious. Uh, my granddaughter just said about true. I like him, Grandpa. He always smiles. We've got lots to smile about. Bear, thank you very much for joining us. You've become quite the regular, aren't you? Bhakti Gary, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to the devotees. Jean, my Bobby. I got back late last night. I didn't get back till 11.30 or so. And I was so pumped up thinking about the words of Radhikarma. It wasn't until after midnight I got to sleep. Uh, Radhikarma had to drive all the way back to Logan, which is about a three-hour drive from the Salt Lake Temple. So as I was pulling out of the parking lot, he was still he still had a crowd of interested people around him asking him questions. And I called out the window. I said, hey, let him go. He's got three. I'm pulling out of the parking lot like 10 o'clock at night. I said, let him go. He's got three times further to travel than I do. So what a great soul to come all that way with his family to give his association and then get back home probably one o'clock in the morning and then he's the chair of the religion department at Utah State University so he said uh, because he's newly <clears throat> been promoted that position he has to be in his office eight o'clock first thing in the morning so we're so fortunate to get the association of these kinds of Mahatmas. Raquel Hare Krishna thanks for joining us Raleigh Good morning, Raleigh. Sachi, so nice to see you and Prashant yesterday and celebrate the appearance of Lord Balaram. It was a wonderful, wonderful, memorable occasion. Govinda Dave wasn't there, but he was also glorified as one of a kind, unique, dynamic wife, Charlotte. So that's just well and good. All of you uh, can take that, uh, and notwithstanding my repetition of, or my attempt to repeat Radhikarman's talk go to the source get it from the horse's mouth so to speak it's right there on the facebook page i'm going to download it as mp4 and put it on our youtube so don't just take what i said he says it's so much more uh seamlessly so much more with so much more realization go ahead and uh, uh expose yourself to that one more time at least guru charan we're looking forward to your joining us here in salt lake city and taking the deity worship to the next level it was Actually, Guru Charan or Govinda Raj, who gave Paki the Balaram deity, which arrived in Salt Lake City just four days before the appearance day of Balaram. You know, Ras Vilas and I were talking a week or so ago about how we're going to have to sort of fudge things in order to glorify Balaram, do some proxy worship because we had no Balaram deity. And yet, lo and behold, Paki arrives back from India, and she's got Krishna Balaram deities. And I told the crowd last night, I think one of the reasons that Lord Balaram arrived in Salt Lake City just four days before his appearance day was that, yes, he wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be personally bathed in the Abhishek, but he wanted to be there for Radhika Raman's talk, for Radhika Raman. He wanted to be in the temple room with Radhika Raman to hear Radhika Raman glorify his younger brother, Krishna. Good morning, Rakesh. Good morning, Jean. Take your leave. Thank you so much. We'll be back tomorrow, a Transcendental Tuesday. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Rama.